Thanks. Thanks very much, Andrew, and thank you all for being here tonight, whether you're with us online. Hello to you joining us online as well as being here in person. And uh, just on a beautiful evening, you have come out, and it's so good to see all of you. Some of you are probably in the class of our speaker, I just think, maybe. Yes, some of you are from, from class. Others of you are taking other courses. Some of you have just come to join us from the community. So a very warm welcome to you. So my job is to tell you a little bit about our format and then introduce our speaker and then get out of the way. So the format for tonight, our speaker will address us for around 50 or so minutes, more or less, and then we'll have around a half an hour or so time for questions. So be thinking of your questions as the evening unfolds. There's two microphones up at the top uh, here of the stairs, and so please come to those mics if you have a question you want to raise so everyone can hear it and those who are online and listening to the recording that will eventually be made will get it as well. If you are viewing online, you can email in a question and we want very much to hear from you and your questions as well. Questions at regent-college.edu. I think that's probably on your screen as you watch this now. So questions at regent-college.edu. We'd be glad to hear from you of our online audience. So that's what we'll do. We'll be all done by around 9 o'clock tonight, and there'll be plenty of daylight to enjoy Vancouver as you head out at 9 o'clock. The days are getting very long here. So thank you so much for joining us. That's what we'll be doing. So um, let me just introduce Michael Cards to you. He's teaching a course this week. We're really honored to have him here at Regent again. After many years of not being here, he is back. Uh, long overdue, I would say. And uh, Michael needs very little introduction probably, but is a, a very well-known singer-songwriter in the Christian music genre and has uh, over 450 songs, many of which you know and you've sung uh, in the catalog. And uh, uh, some of you are very familiar with those. Also a prolific author of, what did you tell me, Michael? 27 books. Um, that's quite a lot. I'm exhausted just talking about four. <laughs> You imagine how tired you are, he says, yes. So 450 songs, 27 books, um, all these records, 35 records. Uh, and so you probably have some contact with Michael Card, and that's probably why you've come here, or you're curious to learn about our topic tonight, listening to the life of Jesus. So it is a real delight uh, to have you with us. And uh, I think uh, you've, got a, you've got something in mind for the piano, Michael's going to speak to us. We'll have a chance for dialogue and discussion at the end. So really, really grateful that you're here with us this week and speaking to us tonight. So let's welcome Michael Card. I'm going to play a couple songs just to calm myself down, if that's all right. Uh, let me see. I forgot what I was going to play. Oh. The time had come, this moment had been waiting. With her alabaster jar, the woman came to give. It was all she had to give. Pouring out the sweet perfume down across his forehead. But some of them began to fume what this waste was for. It should be spent upon. Let her be, it's beautiful to me, and you will have the poor, and they'll be with you always. But can't you see, you'll not always have me, and the fragrance of her gift will always be remembered. She has done all she could do, pouring perfume on my body. She has prepared me for the tomb, though she never knew this was what she came to do. Let her be, it's beautiful to me, and you will have the poor, and they'll be with you always. You see, you'll not all 
always have me and the fragrance of her gift will always be remembered what she has done will never fade from the memory of the gospel when it is preached around the world it will be spoken of in memory of her love a sign shall be given a virgin will conceive a human baby bearing undiminished deity the glory of the nations a light for all to see and hope So what will be your answer? Or will you hear the call of him who did not spare his son, but gave him for us all? On earth there is no power, there is no depth or height that could ever separate us. Let me play you my favorite song. Uh, I mean, of my songs. Um, um, this, and the idea behind the song is part of what makes it my favorite. Uh, but I wrote this song along with a person who I consider to be the best musician I've ever known. Well, he is the best musician I've ever known. You don't know his name. His name's Vance Taylor, but he played with Earth, Wind, and Fire. So, you know them. The song is called Come Lift Up Your Sorrows, and the, the idea to me is so important because at least in American Christianity, um, we, we don't seem to get this. And the, the idea is simply this. Sometimes the most precious thing you have to offer God is your sorrow, is your confusion. That's what happens in the lament psalms. Uh, the, the biggest category of psalms in the Psalter are laments. And to me, one of the most powerful ideas, you, you ask yourself the question, what is Jesus doing at the moment he's being most used by God? He's lamenting. 
So we need to be encouraged to come to God and lift up our sorrow and our confusion and even our anger because that happens too. I mean, Job says some horrible things to God. Uh, but I think it's as Brueggemann says, he, he's, he's not going to leave the dance floor with you until the music stops. So anyway, I don't know if that makes sense or not, but this, this is the song. And I'll teach, I'll teach it to you. And all these cool chords, that's all, that's all Vance. I mean, my songs are. Okay. This is Vance. Hear all that space. to his heart. Come lift up. Come lift up your sorrows and offer your pain. And offer your pain. Come make a sacrifice. And come make a sacrifice of all your shame. Up. 
Come lift up your sorrow and offer your pain and offer your pain and make a sacrifice. Come make a sacrifice. All your shame there in your wilderness is waiting. Worship him. To worship him with your wounds, for he's wounded too. Um, well, my wife would probably say different. But <laughs> oh, you've, you've only been talking three hours a day. Uh, yeah, well, we're, we're going to talk about the details of Jesus' life and what they mean and what it means to listen to the details of his life. I've spent the last couple of years, I, I, I want to know everything there is to know about him. And there were there are two moments that sort of got me to this place. The first one was I, I was... Uh, doing a Bible class somewhere years ago, and uh, a little old lady was there, about my age, and uh, she said, uh, you, you know, did Jesus have any brothers? I said, well, yeah, I know, you know, I know, I know two, I know James, James and Jude, because they wrote, but I'm not really sure. Well, we, he's got four brothers, and we know their names, right? Joseph, Judas, he has a brother named Judas, Jude, uh, Simon, and um, what's his fourth brother's name? I can never remember. Anyway, he's got four brothers. He's got at least two sisters, which means he lives in a household of nine people. Joseph, Mary, four brothers, at least two sisters, and him. I didn't know that. I still can't remember the fourth brother. Simon, everyone's named Simon. Simon, uh, James, Jude, and? Hmm? Can't hear you. Joseph, right. Thank you. Thank you. See, we, we should know the names of his brothers. We should know everything there is to know about him. And not knowing that sort of set me on this, this, uh, this uh, uh, path. And then years later, I was, in, uh, I was in Israel. I have a friend there who's a rabbi, and his name is Moshe. And I'm always trying to impress him with my knowledge of Judaism, which is kind of a stupid thing to do. But, um, and I'm bragging to him about how kosher Jesus is. What an observant really conservative. Jesus is the conservative. The Pharisees are the liberals. You know, Jesus is the one who says, you know, what does Moses say? Go show yourself to the priest. Jesus is the one who won't let people carry things through the temple court. And he, in many ways, he's the conservative. But anyway, um, so I'm talking to Moshe, and, and I make this point that, you know, there are three, three pilgrimage feasts, tabernacles, uh, Passover, and Pentecost. And I said, Jesus uh, doesn't have to make these pilgrimages because you only have to do it if you live within 25 miles of the city. Jesus lives 100 miles away, but he still goes to these three pilgrimage feasts. And so I'm bragging, Jesus is, is such a kosher, you know, observant Jew. And Moshe looks at me and says, yeah, but what does that mean? I go, what do you mean? He goes, well, what does it mean? I said, well, why don't you tell me? He said, it means that Jesus spends almost three months out of every year walking back and forth to Jerusalem. Ten days down, ten days there, and ten days back. And that completely blew my mind. So now, not only do I want to know everything there is to know, but I want to learn to stop and ask, what does that mean? What does that fact mean? Okay? So the first, first thing I want to bring up is, what's Jesus' favorite verse? Well, I think, I think we know. I think we know. Um, this is Matthew 22, uh, 34. Hearing that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, the Pharisees got together. One of them, an expert in the law, tested him with a question. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment of the law? Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. That's the Shema. And, it, and there's another incident. This is in uh, Mark 12. One of the teachers of the law came and heard them debate, debating. Noticing that Jesus had given them a good answer, 
He said, of all the commandments, which is the most important? The most important one, Jesus answered, is this one. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. It's called the Shema. Shema Israel Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad. Ve'ha'avta et Adonai Eloheka v'kol avavka v'kol lefeshka v'kol meodecha. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. It, it's the great statement of monotheism. So the first one, listen. Shema is really listen. Listen, Israel. And the second mandate is you must love him with everything you've got. All your heart, love, all your soul. And with the last word is kind of hard to translate. With all your muchness, with everything you are. Okay? And my, my professor, William Lane, taught me that the Shema really teaches the best way to love God is to listen to him. The best way to love anybody is to listen to him. <laughs> you really want to love your spouse, stop doing things for them and listen to them. You want to love your kids, stop buying them things and listen to them. The best way to love someone is to listen to them. Listening is loving. And I, I include this when I, when I listen to the word of God. I love God by listening to his word. Listen to him speak to me through his word. And so uh, it, it's the basic idea of what I call the biblical imagination. Um, we're, we're, uh, we're all agreed here that we're fallen, right? I mean, we have no problem with that, that we're broken. This world is not the way it's supposed to be. Are you good with that? Yeah, okay, I'm good with that. We're broken, we're fragmented. And I would say that part of that fragmentation is between our head and our heart. One of the things Jesus does with his teachings, with his parable, is he, re he reintegrates us. It's one reason he doesn't answer questions very often either. He's, he's demanding that you engage. You know, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. That's Jesus' way of saying, if you don't listen to this, you're not going to get it, and I'm not going to explain it to you. He only explains one of the parables pri in private to the disciples. Otherwise, he leaves you with the t in the freedom uh, to have this aha moment on your own as you engage with your imagination. And so um, one of the things that happens when we're reintegrated, our imagination becomes the bridge between our heart and our mind. I think that's what Jesus' teaching is all about. So that's, that's my basic MO. We listen to God. We listen to the voice of Scripture. We listen to the details of Scripture, and we ask them what they mean. Um, let me read you a little, uh, little essay uh, I just wrote this, so you probably, we'll see. If you don't, if you don't like it, don't tell me because I'm very frail, frail right now, okay? Just. <laughs> but this is a, about the difference between knowing and knowing about. People, there are people who know a lot about Jesus, but they don't know him. And there are people who know him, but they don't really know that much about him, okay? But we want to be the both, don't we? We want to know, know him, but then know everything there is to know about him. Uh, on Saturday, September 3rd, 1966, my father and I had a meeting in our pastor's office. I was nine years old and had walked the aisle to receive Jesus the previous Sunday, which was August 28th. Our pastor, a gentle and soft-spoken man named James Hopkins, who in our day we called Brother Hopkins, Southern Baptist, he wanted to meet with us to make sure I understood what I had gotten myself into. My father, a busy doctor, had taken the time to come with me. I don't remember anything of the discussion except Brother Hopkins at one point asking me if I had invited Jesus into my heart. I think he invited me into his heart, I responded. It was one of the first insights I ever had regarding what was different about Jesus. I hadn't asked him into my heart. He'd asked me into his heart. That's why I walked the aisle. Brother Hopkins opened a new Bible and presented it to me. On the inside cover, he wrote these words, I accepted Jesus as my personal Savior in Inglewood Baptist Church. And then in my father's handwriting, Saturday, September 3rd, 1966, below on a crude dotted line in my childish hand of block letters, I didn't have a signature yet, Mike Card. Below those words, uh, witnessed by James Hopkins, pastor, and below that, looking like one of the signatures on the Declaration of Independence, my father's William J. Card dad. Three weeks later, I was baptized. That was the 25th. That was 56 years ago. Since then, according to popular parlance, I might say I have followed Jesus. The truth is I've been led by Jesus, the shepherd of a reluctant, frightened, and remarkably clueless sheep. After all... I didn't ask him into my heart. He asked me into his. On that September 3rd Sunday morning, half a century ago, 
I came to know Jesus. Growing up in a Christian home, I'd come to understand that Jesus had died on a cross. At age nine, I realized that he'd done that for me. Once again, I didn't give my life to him on Saturday 3rd, 1966. He had given his life for me on a Friday in the Jewish month of Av, somewhere around the year 33 AD. In the half century since, he's gone on giving me his life. As a little boy, I had some rather vague ideas about Jesus, that he was a carpenter, that he lived someplace called Galilee. I knew what he looked like, auburn hair, blue eyes. At least that's how the Sunday school books pictured him. I'm not scoffing at my church's portrayal. In China, Jesus is often pictured with Asian pictures, features. In the, tip, in the nativity scene at the Black Missionary Baptist Church I frequent, he's, a, he's African. And these should not be seen as inaccuracies, rather as evidence that each community has braced Jesus as their own. Go. I don't roll my eyes anymore when the, with the black nativity scene at my church. In the years that followed, especially after the explosion that was the Jesus movement of the 70s and the 80s, I learned more about Jesus. I went to university and studied his life in more detail, learning about the Judaism and Hellenism that shaped his world, about the Romans and their brutal hold on his people. Since then, I've written... Uh, and researched hundreds of songs about him, uh, 20-odd books, as many records. I know more about Jesus, but I would hesitate to say that I know him more than I did when he first invited me into his life. Why don't we know Jesus better? Let me give you some reasons. <clears throat> Distance is one reason we don't know him better. Uh, I Googled it. His house is 6,578 miles from my house. That's a long way, and distance makes a difference. Right now, I'm 2,553 miles from my house. I Googled that yesterday. Distance in time, 2,000 years, it's an unimaginably long time. Uh, a, b a big battle of the Civil War happened in my town in, in, in Franklin in uh, 1865. 2,000 people died in like four hours in my town. And even that is unimaginably long. I, I, I can't wrap my head around battles happening where there's a parking lot at the Kmart now. You know, people, uh, lines of soldiers shooting at each other and um, that sort of thing. So 2,000 years is a long time. Cultural distance is another problem. The admixtures of cultures in Jesus' time. In our class, we've been talking about how fragmented Jesus' world is. That's the word for Jesus' world, fragmented. No one agrees on anything. There is no Judaism in Jesus' world. This is Isaiah Gaffney, a great Jewish scholar. He says there are Judaisms in Jesus' world. And you know that from reading the Gospels. We got Pharisees, seven different groups of Pharisees. They don't agree on anything either. Sadducees, we got Pharisees in the synagogue. We got Sadducees in the temple. We got Essenes. I mean, you name it. We've got all this fragmentation. No one agrees on anything. And into this mix comes Jesus and the good news of the kingdom of God. And the good, good, the good news of the, of the kingdom is that God has begun to reign. And uh, I'm still trying to wrap my head around that one. Another reason we don't know Jesus well is we have such a small slice of his life. I was teaching in uh, South Dakota, a college group, and I, I, um, I assigned them a paper. And, uh, oh, they, you, you would have thought I wanted a pint of blood. They were all groaning and upset that they had to write a paper. And a young woman, I, I told her, I said, I'm going to make your name famous. Her name is Rachel Hutcherson. Rachel comes up to me. I'm going to drop the class. I don't know why I took this class. I'm a math major. I said, hmm, okay, math major, you don't have to write a paper. She goes, oh. I said, what I want from you is a number. I want to know the percentage of Jesus' life that I have in the Gospels. Well, that captured her imagination. And it was only supposed to be five pages. She came, comes back two days later with like 15 pages of calculations. She had calculated how long in minutes each one of the events in the Gospels took. And she synchronized the synoptics and she the, and then added John and, you know, and divided that into three years. And this is the number that Rachel came up with, 0.09%. She said it this way, if Jesus' life is $100, we have nine cents of it. That's amazing. Now, I believe the Bible's perfect. I believe 0 0.09 is perfect. What would we do if we had 50% of it? We can't process 0 0.09, Right? 
So, but that's another reason. We just have such a small uh, window into his life. Another reason we don't know him better is we let other people know him for us, the professionals. Don't do that. Because Jesus can be known as no one else is known. You realize that? You know Jesus in a way you know no one else. We'll talk about that in a minute. Another reason I don't know him better is that I read the Gospels with an over-familiarity. I, I, I pretty much know what the next verse is going to say. I, I say it this way. I basically listen to the Gospels the way I listen to my wife. I know what she's going to say, right? And I'm, I'm right most of the time. I mean, I'm not being snide about this. I mean, we've been married 42 years. I know, what she's, I know what she's about to say. And that's not really listening to someone, is it? You know, we, we listen with half-parted lips, Malty Babcock says. And uh, so that's another, another reason I don't know him better. Frankly, I don't like a lot of his current friends, enough said. I'm frightened by his absolute lordship. Does that ever frighten, does Jesus ever frighten you? That there are these non-negotiables in his teaching that we uh, wiggle out of as best we can? If you don't do this, you can't be my disciple. Non-negotiables. Take up the cross. Die to yourself. Those sort of things. So those are basically um, why we don't know him better. Let me give you my sketch of Jesus and then we'll look at some passages, okay? Here's my sketch. Ready? This is my favorite thing. This is from the biological characteristics of Jew Jewish burials in the Hellenistic and Roman period, something probably most of you have read. Uh, they excavated around 200 graves from the first century Jewish males, and this is the, the numbers they come up with. Average height, five foot six, that's this. So Jesus is about five foot six. Now you're thinking he's short. No, he's not short. Everyone's short, <laughs> right? Five foot six. Average hair length, three inches. So the Auburn-haired Jesus, no. Uh, skin honey-colored, Semitic, obviously. Um, he's virtually unrecognizable in the crowd. He looks just like everyone else. How do I know that? Because Judas has to point him out to the soldiers. And his own disciples don't recognize him 100 yards away in John 21 after the second miraculous catch of fish. They don't recognize him. He's, it's not like he's taller or short or there's that much uh, a difference in his appearance. If there was, it would have turned up in the gospel they would have made fun of him if he was short or fat or you know something different but the idea is he's unrecognizable in a crowd um he was he wears a short knee-length tunic the, if you've seen the chosen they've gotten that just right um he doesn't like people that wear long robes scribes he makes fun of those guys he thinks that's well i won't say sissy because that's not the word he uses but he makes fun of people who wear long robes over that tunic he wears a mantle that's usually made out of wool and it's almost heartbreaking that that's what he uses for a blanket when he sleeps on the ground most of the time. Uh, no yarmulke. That's not until the 5th century. No side locks. He speaks three languages. How do I know that? Because everyone speaks three languages in his world. He speaks uh, Judeo-Koine Greek. Uh, he speaks Hebrew. And he speaks Galilean Aramaic. Not just Aramaic, but Galilean Aramaic. And what that means is there are certain syllables that Jesus can't pronounce. Is that not a cool idea? You know the whole shibboleth thing in the Hebrew Bible in Judges? Uh, Judges 12, 6. So the, like the difference between sha and sa, Jesus doesn't make that difference. And it makes him sound uneducated. Uh, in, in, uh, in Acts, his disciples who are Galileans are also thought of, they're, they're called idiotes. It doesn't mean they're idiots. It just means they're uneducated. And uh, there are certain syllables that he can't pronounce. What a cool idea that is. Uh, I already said this. He grows up in a household of nine people. His grandfather's name are, are Jacob and Heli. As, an eld as the eldest in the family, he would have had special responsibility. And as a carpenter, he would have been regarded as particularly learned. Did you know that? In the synagogue, a common statement was, quote, is there a carpenter or the son of a carpenter among us who can solve this problem for us? David Flusser shares that in Sage of Galilee. From at least the age of 12, he seems to have had an awareness of his special relationship with God, who he refers to as his father. That's in Luke 2. His favorite verse is Deuteronomy 6.4. We've already, already uh, looked at that. 
he shows open disdain for the new innovations that the Pharisees are bringing out. Uh, the, or, the oral law, we've talked a lot about this in our class. They're innovating. You can't spit on the Sabbath. Did you know that? Because the spit might run downhill. And if it runs downhill, that makes mud. And making mud is work. So you can't spit on the Sabbath. How does Jesus heal the blind man? He spits and makes mud, right? Does Jesus need mud to heal someone? No. He can heal in absentia. He doesn't have to be there. Go home, your daughter's well. Absolute lordship. So he, he breaks these oral traditions every chance he gets. But the interesting thing to me is he adds his own innovations. The pillars of Jewish piety, giving to the poor, uh, fasting and, and prayer, right? If, if, if you are an um, uh, observant Jew, those are the pillars. You, they're not optional. But Jesus adds an innovation to those. You, can you think of what his innovation is? You do them in secret. When you pray, you go to an inner room. You don't stand out in the street and pray. When you give to the poor, you don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. And as far as we know, that's an original sort of figure of speech of Jesus. Uh, incredible. So Jesus, Jesus uh, kind of as a rabbi, the one reason they call him rabbis, he, he, uh, he innovates. He makes innovations. But he does not like the oral law. He calls it rules made by men in Matthew 15. Um, but he is observant. He goes to the synagogue. He travels to Jerusalem for the pilgrimage feast, even though he doesn't have to. He pays the half shekel tax. Though as a teacher, he should have been exempt. Um, he, when he heals a leper, he sends him to the priest to be examined. He won't carry, allow people to carry anything in the temple. At least nine times in the Gospels, he hides. And that's fascinating to me. Jesus in hiding is fascinating to me. Seven times he asked people to keep his messiahship a secret. Don't tell anybody. Or he'll heal someone and say, please don't tell anybody. But they never do. How can you not tell? And the result is he's so covered up with people who want to be healed or want a free meal that he has to flee to the wilderness. That's part of my sketch of Jesus. Thirty-two times in the Gospels his emotions are described, and it's usually compassion. The Gospels never mention him smiling or laughing, but I hope he did. I sure hope he did. There is one unique moment, I think it's my favorite, in Luke 10, 21, when it's said that Jesus is filled with joy through the Holy Spirit. Filled with joy through the Holy Spirit. The 70 have just come back from a mission, a successful mission. And Jesus has this realization that God is hiding things from the wise and revealing them to little children. And it's that thought that fills him with joy, that God is turning the world upside down, that the people who are on the inside are now on the outside, and the outsiders are now on the inside, and this fills him with joy through the Holy Spirit. I, I love that. I feel like I'm, I'm getting closer. I'm getting closer. Uh, I already said that uh, roughly uh, we only have .09 of his life. Um, if, that was, if his life is $100, we have nine cents. So in, in my church, we used to say, well, he only wept twice. Well, he only wept twice in 0.09%. So let me give you the math for that. Uh, uh, someone in math did, did the calculations, and she said if that was 0.09, then basically in three years he would have wept 300 times. That's an average of 1.3 times a week. Now, I know it's silly to reduce this to math. I mean, I understand it's kind of foolish, but uh, I'm trying to make a point. Some of those ideas we grew up with, he only, he only did this once. We only, well, he only did it once in .09, so uh, we need to put, that, put our thinking hats. Um, 53 times in the Gospels, he's misunderstood. Uh, I call it the motif of misunderstanding. He will say, amen, which is his red flag way of saying, I'm about to say something very important. And in general, well, basically every time they misunderstand. Um, his mother and brothers think he's out of his mind. The very people who should have understood his mother and brothers. And John the Baptist, John the Baptist should have, should have gotten it. I mean, he, he knew who Jesus was in utero, right? He leaps in his mother's womb when Jesus gets close to him. But John gets put in prison and he sends his, uh, some of his disciples to Jesus with a question. What's the question? Are you the Messiah or should we look for someone else? So John didn't get him either. John didn't get him either. Uh, 45 times he quotes the Hebrew Bible, 
And notice I'm careful to call it the Hebrew Bible and not the Old Testament. Uh, and I don't even totally agree with that anymore. He doesn't quote the Hebrew Bible. He thinks in the Hebrew Bible. You know, there will be a, a phrase and we'll say, oh, Jesus is alluding to Isaiah 35. No, he's not alluding to Isaiah. He thinks in Isaiah. He thinks in uh, the books of Moses. And finally, um, you know, we all, we, we know his, his Hebrew name would have been Yeshua, Yeshua, right? But I just learned this uh, recently that uh, he, Jesus has a nickname. I mean, my name is Michael, but my, uh, my nickname is Mike. You want, you want the big word for this? I mean, why use a little word that everyone can understand when you can use a big word that no one understands? It's, it's called a hypochorism. Lucian is, is Luke's name. Luke is a hypochoratic name. Mike is a hypochoratic name, short for Michael. Demas is short for Demetrius. We, we have a lot of these people in the, in the Bible. Well, Jesus' nickname would have been Yeshu. When they're walking down the road or when he's with his family, he would have been referred to as Yeshu. I never heard that before, and I'm trying that in my fragmented uh, prayer life. I hope he doesn't mind. I hope I'm getting it right. So anyway, um, I want to look at some biblical passages and, um, and look at some of the details. I, actually, there's really, really only one I want to look at. Yeah, I only have one I want to look at. We're good, we're good on time. Uh, this is John 7. Um, after this, Jesus traveled in Galilee since he did not want to travel in Judea because the Jews there were trying to kill him. The Jewish Feast of Tabernacles was near, so his brother said to him, Leave here and go to Judea so that your disciples can see the work that you're doing, for no one does anything in secret while he's seeking public recognition. recognition. If you do these things, show yourself to the world. And John is the gospel that whispers, and John whispers, for even his own brothers didn't believe in him. So that was all mocking. Because of John's parenthetical statement, we know that, that was, they were being uh, smart Alex. For even his own brothers didn't believe in him. Jesus told him, my time has not yet arrived, but your time, your time is always at hand. The world cannot hate you, but it does hate me, because I testify about it, that its works are evil. So in the opening of chapter 7, you find out that Jesus is going to tabernacles. And there's this whole uh, 36 verses of Jesus talking about the, the feast and, and uh, all kinds of details. But then um, we have this verse in 37. On the last and most important day of the festival, Jesus stood and cried out in a loud voice, if anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. If you really love God's word and listen to the detail in God's word, there's something going on here uh, that if you know the detail, it will change your life. And when I was taught this by William Lane, nothing's ever been the same. But I just told you the details, right? It's tabernacles, right? One of the three festival of uh, pilgrimage feasts. Um, but you probably don't know what happens on the last and greatest day of the feast, down there in verse 37. That's why we, we have scholars who help us with, that's why we have places like Regent to help us with those things. Let me tell you what happens on the last and greatest day of the feast. The high priest steps out into the front porch of the temple and he has a silver pitcher, some, some accounts say it's golden, but he has a pitcher in his hand. And they're singing uh, Hallel Psalms and there's uh, accounts of people juggling and one guy who can do a backflip and land on one hand. I mean, it's raucous. And they process down through the city of David to the pool of Siloam. And the high priest gets to the pool and he dips that pitcher full of water and holds it up. And they're going nuts. They're singing. They're doing backflips and landing on their fingertips. And then they go back up through the city of David. Back into the temple area, through the court up onto the porch of the temple. And then the high priest stands in the, in the front of the people and he quotes a passage from the Hebrew Bible and he pours the water out. And this is the passage that he quotes. With joy you will draw water from the wells of salvation. 
And from the back of the crowd, in a loud voice, you hear someone shout, If a man is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. You get that? That's, that's a detail that makes this come to life. If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. It's, a, it's, it's an, this amazing moment, and you, you get the moment by listening to the detail of Scripture and trusting the people who can uh, help you with your homework. And that's probably why you're here. So, so be encouraged. Let me pray. Lord Jesus, we come to you as your children who, who want to be made wise by your word. Thank you that we find ourselves here in, in the midst of all these resources and, and these men and women who love your word and want to teach us your word. Pray that, uh, Holy Spirit, you would speak to us and help us to find our place here at Regent. Help us to see what you want us to do. Put the, the pieces of the puzzle of our life together all so that we can serve you better, love you better, and wash feet for your sake. We do love you. We want to serve you better. And we ask this in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen. Let me play one more song and then we're going to do some questions. Okay? Oh, can I play a hard song? Okay, I'm risking this for you. I'm going to mess up. I'm going to crash and burn, but I want to do this for you. Do you feel manipulated? You are being manipulated. <laughs> Descending from the sky So brilliant with the light of God The city is his bride There is no temple in this town No sun, no moon, no lamp For God's own glory is its light Illuminated by the Lamb and God himself will wipe the tears from every weeping eye. No death, no pain, no mourning cry, and every tear may dry. And now our God will dwell with them, the new Jerusalem. And he himself will walk with them. So let all of those who thirst come now and drink for free. And to the ones who overcome, come now and you will see. Behold, the old has passed away. Now everything is new. The Alpha and Omega's words are trustworthy and so true and God himself will wipe the tears from every weeping eye no death, no pain no mourning cry and every tear may dry and now for you can stay right there. Oh, okay. Well, Actually, you, what I'm going to... answer them. No, I'm not going to answer them. I can sit down. I can sit down. No, no, we want you to stay up here. But, but you're going to stay there. If I don't know the answer, you'll answer it for me. 
Yeah, of course. Awesome. Okay. It's a deal. I feel so much better. I thought what we would do is just take like a 90 second stand up and stretch break and, it just, and we'll come back to your questions in say 90 seconds. So get up, move your limbs, talk to your neighbors, come up with questions. We'll be back in 90 seconds. And they, but they need to be questions about Jesus, no trick questions. No trick questions. questions. Okay. Okay, folks. You're welcome to take your seats and we'll turn to questions. We've just determined George Guthrie has been disallowed from asking questions. No, no questions no, no. from that guy. No questions. Okay. That, and that's no, not because he's a New Testament scholar, it's because he's from Tennessee. Yeah. And, so. and, and no trick questions like where do babies come from? I'm not going to answer those questions. Yeah. Okay. Good. So we're staying away from biology as much as possible. Yes, definitely. Okay, very good. So uh, you've got questions. There's two microphones up here at the top of the stairs. Feel free to go up there and have a look. We'll take questions online that are coming in to Andrew at the back. So let me start with the question. In your studying of the life of Jesus, what was the thing or what has been the thing that has surprised you the most? Oh, that's a great question. I'm actually going to have to think before I answer that question. Uh, I, I, okay, I think recently this idea that he is the conservative and the Pharisees are the liberals, that was a very, that was, of course, he's not just a conservative. He's, Jesus isn't just one thing. You can't say that about him. He's so many things. But in many ways, he's very conservative. That's a new idea for me. I thought, oh, he's the rebel. He's going to, mm -hmm. you know, tear down, you know, the, the structures of the, the Pharisees, which, he's, which, which didn't happen. But... Um, yeah, I think that the idea that Jesus is, has a conservative voice, that was a new idea for me. But he's still a rebel, too. So he's not just a conservative. Yeah. Good. So, do you want me to keep going with more questions, or do you want to, you know, take your turn up here? There's microphones. No questions about Jesus? Oh, no, oh, there, there's always ask. questions. No, if you don't have you questions about Jesus. Question. What is it? Yeah. There we go. Uh, well, I just wanted to ask, as a, as a musician and as a songwriter, do you see any evidence for the sort of lyrical or musical in the life of Jesus that might not immediately jump out to people? Ask that another way. I, don't, I still don't get it. Ask it another way. Um, do you see Jesus doing things that suggests... Uh, a musical inclination oh. or, or music in his life. I, obviously, he quotes the Psalms, but is there anything that stands out to you that goes like, that reminds me of what I do as a songwriter? Yeah. Well, we, I mean, we only sing, he only sings once, right? And that's after the last meal, they sing a hymn. But I think, you knowing Judaism, there, music is a huge part. The chants, uh, I mean, I know, a, I know a song that he would have known. You want to hear one of his songs? The song that he would have sung? 
Esayenai el heharim, meayin yavo ezri, ezri meim Adonai, o se shamayim ba'aretz. So that's the kind of music he would have been surrounded uh, by. But I do Can you think do the translation? I lift up my eyes into the hills. That's, it's that psalm. I lift up my eyes unto the hills. From when shall come my help? My help is from the Lord God, maker of heaven and earth. So they mm. sing the psalms. But mm. I think his life is, I, I, I think this is part of what you're asking. I think there's an aspect of his life that's lyrical. And I, there's some things that you can, I think, can only express about Jesus in song. You, you can't just didactically say he's this or that, but you sing. Socrates says when the soul hears music, it lets down its best guard. And I think you can, you can put certain things, uh, certain truths about Jesus. They, they only, or they work best. I won't say they only work, but they work best when they're sung. That's why the church sang so much, you know? Yeah. So, so let's stick with the Psalms for a minute. It's okay. interesting that, that you went there. So the Psalms and the life of Jesus, music, yes. singing. Yes. Right? Do you want to... What, you've been probably thinking about this. Well, I suspect you have. Well, uh, again, I mean, I think wh wh where I would land on that is Jesus doesn't quote the Psalms. He thinks in the Psalms. And that, that whole range of emotions, I mean, clearly, I think he, he, at some point in his life, he sees himself spoken of in the Psalms, his suffering. And, uh, and actually, there's a, there's a more accurate description of crucifixion in the Psalms than there is in the Gospels. So, and, and he, he is saturated with those things. He knows exactly what's about to happen to him. But, uh, you know, my tongue is dried up like a potsherd. My, it, my, my tongue cleaves to the roof of my mouth, that sort of thing. All my joints are out of, bones are out of joint, that sort of thing. So, yeah. Um, but the interesting thing is, I think in Jesus' day, the, salt, the Psalms aren't part of canon yet. Right? That's the other thing that they're fragmented. They don't agree on the Bible. The, the uh, Sadducees only like the Torah, uh, the Pharisees like the law and the prophets, and nobody knows what to do with the Psalms yet. There's no, that idea of canon doesn't happen until later. Everything is fragmented. No one agrees on anything. It's, even the land is fragmented. Everything is fragmented in his world. And that's a big idea, I think. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Thank you very much. Let's go up here to the top of the stairs. I was thinking on that note about uh, music, uh, singing. Would it probably have been another way of remembering yes. truth, like oral tradition? Singing would have been another way of remembering things Abs about the life of Christ. Absolutely. I, th I think music is. I mean, you know, they, they learn their ABCs by the, with the Psalms. I mean, they're the alphabetic Psalms, right? And I think um, it, it's just woven. It's just part of the fabric of their life. They, people don't quote the Psalms, they think in the Psalms. They, they learn their ABCs in Scripture, and they learn to sing. And, uh, oh, no, okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, you'll yeah. like the question. Oh, he, good. he wants to know your favorite place in Tennessee, yeah. probably. Yeah. The, no, George, if, go ahead. If you don't know this man and you live here, get to know this man. He's awesome. He's one of my good friends. <laughs> Amen. Okay, don't hurt me, George. <laughs> I won't. Um, so, Mike, I, I know the answer to this question, I think, but... You are known for integrating uh, scripture into your song and your life, and you're, you're a very integrated person. Thank right? you. So um, what drew you into integrating? It, your music is distinct in that it is an embodiment of the scriptures, really. What drew you into that? How did, how did that happen oh. in your life? And I'm thinking... Okay, thank you. You know, yeah. thanks for answering. There answer. you go. So this is. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, thanks, <laughs> thanks, thanks, thanks for throwing me that uh, freebie. Uh, well, what he's referring to, um, I, I grew up in Nashville playing music. Um, Earl Scruggs, the banjo player. Uh, I grew up with his kids. I spent the night at his house with uh, with his sons, and Randy and Steve and I made music together. We had a little bluegrass band, so I grew up playing music. My mother was a violinist who toured. My father was a jazz musician. Uh, he played trombone, ugh, <laughs> and, and he played he played big band jazz. My sister has a master's degree in organ, and my brother's a bluegrass. I mean, you, you just can't get away from music in my house. So I grew up playing, always playing, and um, I went to school uh, as a forestry major. 
I was going to study forestry. I wanted to be a, I wanted to do bird counsel for the forestry service. I still think that'd be a really cool job. <laughs> okay. And uh, part of being at Western, Western Kentucky University's little school in Bowling Green, Kentucky, you had to take a religion class. And so I sat in or uh, took this class by a guy that is really important in, to George and I. His name was William Lane. William, uh, Dr. Lane was a PhD from Harvard. He spoke 16 languages, one of the NIV translators, wrote two major commentaries. He was a really smart guy. But he was also this wonderful, childlike, sweet man. He walked into that first class and uh, I'm, in the Jesus, I'm from the Jesus movement, so he's the enemy, right? The professor in religion is your enemy because he's going to tear your religion down and make, leave you to put it back together on your own, right? He was the guy that we were afraid of. And Bill walks into class, big bushy eyebrows. He was this character. He sits on the corner of the desk and he says, my name is William Lane and you only need to know one thing about me. I'm a man under the authority of God's word. He said that in a secular university. And my mouth fell open, and I thought, I want to be that guy. I took the class with him, and at the end of the class, I changed my major to biblical studies and studied with him, got a master's with him. But Bill was also the first person, I think that's what you're pointing at, Bill also the first person that asked me to write a song. He gave leadership to an African-American church in, in Bowling Green, wonderful pastor to that church. And uh, one, one day he said, uh, Mr. Card, you play the guitar, don't you? I said, yeah, but the guitar is mainly for attracting girls in the student center. You don't understand, you don't understand this, Dr. Lane. He goes, uh, here's, my, here's my sermon for next week. Write us a chorus. And I would have never written music, if it, a single song, if it wasn't for Dr. Lane in that, that moment. And so for six years, not every Sunday, but many of the Sundays, he would give me a sermon and I would write a little song or a chorus. Uh, the song Emmanuel is the song that he preached when he married my wife and I. He he did this. He actually talked my wife into marrying me, and then he married us. And, <laughs> and Emmanuel, in, in the context of marriage, if God is with you, who could be against you? That's the that was what he preached when, when we got married. And uh, it kind of funny. I, I I was actually I was actually listening to what he was saying. And uh, a, a few months later, I wrote the song, and it came out on the radio. And he heard it. He was in Seattle at this point. He goes, Michael, I just heard your new song, Emmanuel. What a marvelous use of scripture you have. I said, I go, I laughed. I said, Dr. Langs, that's the sermon you preached at our wedding. Oh, 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 I hear him laugh. He said, I did think it was particularly fine. <laughs> got Great. Yeah, let's go up here. Guy. I was just wondering, the, the Jesus you offer us tonight is much more, um, less academic and harsh. And um, I wonder if that much more of a man of sorrows high priest who identifies with us that seems to be what you're saying or at least the portion you're giving us which I'm not arguing against I wonder if that's much more what we need today in terms of preaching much more today than what we need in terms of our apologetics towards those issues that we stand against as a church so we present to Jesus much more what you do tonight where he is a, a person a man who has emotions who's able to cry Three other times, whatever it was you said, uh, uh, who was from a family who, who obviously would have had to deal with dynamics as a teenager, who's also a, brought up by a single mother. Um, I'm wondering if that's the kind of Jesus we need more of today mm -hmm. in our secular society in terms of our witness rather than a harder-headed Jesus who would be preaching against this, that, and the other thing. You seem to present yep. us. Yep. And it's Thanks. not a criticism. It's just an observation. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. I didn't. I couldn't catch. Both to, of that. to to rephrase what what guy has been saying, and, and the the kind of Jesus that we actually have in the Gospels, the man of sorrows, the man of tears, compassion, and so on, rather than the sort of in a sense hard nosed Jesus who's over against the sinners, mm -hmm. is that something we need to recover? Oh, absolutely. Well, I mean, we, we we're always working to recover the biblical Jesus anyway, and take him kind of from the jaws of cu culture and that sort of thing, but. Um, we, we looked at this passage today when uh, Lazarus died, um, and Jesus, he waits. Of course, he waits till he's been in the tomb for three days, or four days, and he's talking to Martha, and he talks to Mary. Well, what I've learned is it's a really neat moment to see how Jesus sort of works because he doesn't have a, a pat, hard-nosed way of dealing with any situation. Martha needs someone to talk to her, so he talks to her. They talk about the resurrection, and your brother will rise. 
Mary just needs somebody to cry with her. So Mary, and Martha and Mary come and they say the exact same thing to him. If you'd been here, my brother wouldn't have died. And Jesus talks to Martha and they walk, you know, they kind of take a walk. Then Mary gets there and she's crying. He cries with her. And I, I think that's a wonderful insight into this, just this character of Jesus. He's, he, he, he understands what we need. Some of us need to be talked to and reasoned with. And some, someone just needs to, he needs to see our tears. Um, so I don't know if that answers your question, but that's, that's, I, I'm, I'm kind of moving that direction. And I do think we have to re- keep recovering the real Jesus of Scripture and not the American Jesus or the, you know, whatever, you know, mm. the prosperity Jesus. Yeah. Mm. Great. So, Thank you. Let's go up to the mic over here. Um, thank you, Michael. Thank you. Uh, that was wonderful. Um, you mentioned uh, in your sketch of Jesus uh, that from the age of 12, he seems to have an awareness of his special relationship with his father. And that's yeah. tr- very true. Also in that passage is the line, he grew in wisdom and in stature right. and in favor with God and with men. Right. Um, Which, by the way, is a parallel statement that's with the John the yes. Baptist. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, and... And so just with that, that that statement seems mysterious to me and probably to most people because, you know, we have to learn about God um, as we grow. Uh, Did Jesus have to learn about God, learn about a special relationship? Absolutely. He took upon himself all the limitations of flesh. Now, I studied Bible with a little old lady in in Nashville, Tennessee, Miss Whittemore. She had hundreds of people in her Bible class. And she used to teach that when Jesus was in the cradle, he could have stood up and talked. Well, even when I was 16, that didn't make a whole lot of sense to me, (laughs) right? No, he takes upon himself all the limitations of the flesh. But at the same time, you know, that's that's the problem. He seems to... I mean, he has this, he's empowered by God to do these incredible things, healing, walk on water, you know, and so we just can't reduce it to one thing. He, uh, I, like, I like to make the point in class, Jesus will ask people their name or how long has he been this way or he'll look for people until he finds them. Well, that's a very human thing to do. He doesn't seem to, you know, I don't know. It, it, Always have the answer in advance. Yeah, I yeah. think he, he, ta- he willingly, I mean, Hebrews tells us he takes upon himself, right, those limitations. And that's part of the, f- the flesh. But clearly he, he does remarkable things that are divine. He has insights from the Father. Mm-hmm. So um, it, it's hard to reduce it to, uh, I mean, we, we're, th- we, we're thinking Greek. We think in Greek. And everything has to sort of logically make sense to us. Mm-hmm. Uh, the answer generally is one thing for us. Jesus thinks in Hebrew. It's a, it's a different mindset, and the answer isn't always one thing. It can be two things. People say, what's the most important commandment? And he'll give them two. Yeah, yeah. And, and, say, and he says, and that's the most important one. It's that sort of thing. <laughs> yeah. Now, to a Greek mind, that drives you nuts. <laughs> but you've you got to understand his, he's, his mind works in a different way. Jesus thinks in verbs. When Jesus says the kingdom of God has come, what I'm finding out is what he means is the reign of God has begun. Or, you know, so it's, did that, does that answer your question at all? Oh, yeah, no, that's great. Okay. I just wanted to hear you talk about it. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> wondered your thoughts, yeah. If I don't have an answer, I'll make something else oh, up, yeah, and totally. I'll answer that. So. <laughs> no, that's great. Um, we don't seem to have a lot of other questions. Can I ask a second Go one? ahead. Okay. You're, you're allowed. Go for it. <laughs> um, in this listening to the life of Jesus, and, and, uh, and I really, uh, really appreciated how you, said at the beginning in your story is like uh, I didn't accept Jesus he accepted me and yeah yeah, he gave me his life um how has listening but you still have your own life as well how does listening to the life of Jesus help you understand your own life well I, I wouldn't exactly say I still have my own life my life is not my own um, I, th- I think that's part of understanding absolute lordship. Um, he hasn't, thank goodness, he hasn't called me to do. I mean, he's, he called me, he's called me to do some things I didn't want to do that I did anyway. So, but they're very. I'm a I'm a sissy and a coward, and you know, I did smuggle Bibles once into China, and uh, I was so afraid I just about couldn't speak. I was so frightened. So no, my, it, it, my life is not mine. Um, 
But what, what, what was the final question? How is his life? How, how does listening to the life of Jesus help you understand your own? Or how, how does it, has it given you any insights into... Well, I don't know. How did, yeah. I, it, it's funny that I'm, I'm not... I don't feel like I'm that interested in my life anymore. Uh, but, but I do... I, th- I get what your po- uh, the point you're making. In, in terms of listening to your life, you understand you know, your value. I mean, as I listen to his life, I understand. I I just saw a thing on, on the internet the other day. Jesus looked at you and and he looked at the cross and he said, it's worth it. You know, I'll die for you. And so those kinds of things he gives, he gives me the the, the value to my life because he, he, because he loves me and he, he called, he called me. And, uh, and even when I don't see much value to my life and what I do, I, I, I'll trust what he says. I mean, he loves you so he loves you so much he'd rather die than live without you. I mean, think about that. And I think that gives me some purpose. And, uh, but I, I'm not sure if I understand my life better. I've got to think about that. Okay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Thank I you. Think, I can throw Good. words at it. Good question, Stephen. Yeah. Let's go to the mic up here. Yeah, thank you, Michael. Um, my question is about tips, if you have any tips of how to better listen uh, when we're reading our Bibles. How to better what? Listen. How to better listen. Listen. Oh. Well, uh, this, this business, of, again, Maltby Babcock, who wrote um, This Is My Father's World, Maltby Babcock says that we listen with half-parted lips. That is, when you're talking to me, my mouth is already engaged because I'm thinking about what I'm going to say. And not doing that is a good start. You know, not listening in terms, you know, you're, you're giving the question. I'm, I'm immediately thinking, okay, what am I saying? What am I saying? That's not listening. Um, and um, I, in terms of listening to the Bible, we finish the Bible sentences for it all the time. You, and I do that to my wife because I know what she's going to say. <laughs> we got to stop finishing people's sentences. Uh, and I think trusting, trusting that this truth that listening is the best way to love somebody. Uh, I don't know if you have if you had that person in your life. Bill Lane was one of those people. He loved me by listening to, to me, and I think about how much of his time I wasted about these trivial things that I was struggling with in college. And here's this great man of God who was writing commentaries and having these great thoughts. But every Tuesday he would walk with me around campus a couple of times, and I would pour out you know whatever my stupid frustration was. But he loved me by listening to me. Um, I don't know. I still, I still think that's the greatest motivation I have for listening to my wife. Uh, I'm, I'm never going to understand her. She's never going to understand. We've been married 42 years. We just barely get each other. You know, we're just so different. But um, I do love, I know that I love her. And I believe that listening to her is the best way to, to do that. And, and she, she gets it. I think she, you know, she feels loved when I shut the heck up because I talk a lot. When I shut up and listen to her. It's a powerful idea. I don't know if that answers your question, but I, yeah, the best way to love someone is to listen. You need a T-shirt with that. That's, yeah. that's beautiful. That would go well in a T-shirt. Well, that was Bill Lane. Bill Lane yeah. taught me that. Let's go up here to the, the microphone. Uh, thanks, Michael. Um, yeah, you mentioned before a little bit about making the connection between head and heart, and um, I find that even for my myself and my own experience, um, you know, growing up in the church, you develop a lot of this head knowledge of what you you feel like, you know, this is what I believe. But when it comes to, like, functional application of that, you know, you, you realize, you know, maybe I'm not believing this as fully as, as you know, I intellectually feel like I should, mm-hmm. you know. And it's like my mind knows, but my heart doesn't feel that. Like, how, how, how do you find, um, you know, I think it's something that everyone deals with reoccurringly but but what is your kind of approach to those uh, that, that well I'm, I'm always going to opt back to the life of Jesus because it's through mm-hmm. kind of through his life that I try to understand everything and what I I see Jesus pur- purposefully reintegrating people kind of putting people back together their heart and their mind uh, because you all I mean I, my, my best friend is a heart guy his name's Scott Rowley okay if Scott reads from the Bible he's going to cry because it, he's he's all heart, and I have people that are you know they're they're all they're still good people, but they're all you know they're super smart, and they kind of I have, well I have a friend who's got two degrees from MIT, he's super smart, he's a head guy, he's not so much a heart guy. His name Lance, he wouldn't mind me saying that I don't think, 
But what Jesus is trying to do is, and I'm a heart guy. I'm, you know, my heart's on my sleeve. I'm an affirmation junkie, I'll just tell you. you know, and I want to I be smart and learn things, but I'm a heart guy. And what Jesus is trying to do through me is reintegrate my mind and my heart. And what he, what he, that's one of the purposes of parables. Because what he's doing in a parable, he's telling a story. I love there's a couple of occasions where people shout at him from the crowd, well said, Master, oh, may that never happen. Because they, they're caught up emotionally with their heart in these stories that he's telling. He must have been a marvelous storyteller, you know, in terms of inflection and acting things out. But um, I see Jesus in the parables reintegrating the heart, heart and the mind. Why? Because of the Shema. The Shema says we're supposed to love God with all of our heart, with all of our nephesh, soul, translated mind. It's translated different ways. In fact, one time Jesus translates it mind. Um, all of our muchness with everything we are. And so if we're going to love him with everything we are, we have to listen to him with everything we are, our head and our heart. And I think Jesus uniquely helps you do that with parables, with his lyrical life. Um, I don't know. I feel like I'm throwing words. Does that make any sense? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Wow. Okay. I just felt the energy in the room go down. So. <laughs> Are there other questions? All right. I think we're good with questions. One last question from me. Head and heart. What about hands and feet? You mean and action? Action. Yeah. Well, I, I think you, you... Where does that fit with the head and the heart in the way that well, you're reading this whole I, I story? I think the people who serve are the people who are integrated. I mean, they, at least they serve... It, it, when Jesus... Okay, <laughs> go back to Jesus. Uh, when Jesus is washing the disciples' feet, he's serving them, right? Yeah. Hands, he's, he's kneeling, he's dressed like a slave, he pours water in a bowl, and this isn't ritual cleansing, Ritual cleansing is I pour water over my hands and it, it doesn't wash anything away. That's not what Jesus is doing. He's washing the, the funk but from between their toes <laughs> like a slave does. And I think that kind of uh, in, in engagement only happens when that, that reintegration is there. I mean, uh, I'm a heart guy. I'll do something from you because I want to feel better about myself or I want you to like me. You know, and... and do you have someone like that in your life that you, they do things for you and you can feel that pull? You know, uh, I, I think it's when a fully integrated person washes your feet or cares for you or teaches you or what or cleans your house, it doesn't have that weird baggage that goes along with it. It's it it feeds your soul. Uh, I, again, I have a, a very good friend who um, ha had a very difficult life. Uh, and he, he has decided he's going to walk with me and he's going to encourage me. And out of all of his fragileness and all of the uh, 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 horrible things that happened to him when he was growing up, when he serves me, there's nothing, there's no weird pull. He's like, he's, he's on my side, right or wrong. He said, you know what, even when you're wrong, I'm going to be on your side. <laughs> and I realized that's the gospel. Jesus says, you're wrong, but I'm going to be on your side. And that's not how we think. Yeah, right or wrong, I'm going to be on your side. And uh, it's a powerful idea. It's a powerful idea. And so that when he serves me, there's no pull. I don't get that pull. Yeah, I don't, that makes sense. I don't know if it makes that's sense or not. Very good. Yeah. Now, I'm going to ask the audience a question. <clears throat> Do you think that Mike should play one more song for us? Yes. Okay. Do you have something of a benediction song? Huh? Do you have something of a benediction song oh, for us? Oh, I do. Us? I have a benediction Okay, there you go. Then I've got a couple of announcements before we go. Okay. Over to you, Mike. Oh, yes. See, I'll, I just need to be affirmed, that's all. Just a little <laughs> affirmation. My wife says, she goes, when is it ever going to be enough for you? <laughs> and I said, well, when I hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant, that might be enough, <laughs> even for me. So. I'll teach you this one, too. Worship 
in reverence and awe the God of peace. This is your part. And grace be with you all. And may the great shepherd of the sheep equip you with good things for doing his will. And grace be with you all. Ready to try it? Grace be with you all. And grace be with you all. May the great shepherd and may the great shepherd of the sheep equip you suffering of Jesus and bear the disgrace that he bore confessing his name for Christ is the same yesterday today and forever okay ready grace be with you all and grace be with you all. May the great shepherd and may the great shepherd of the sheep equip you equip you with good things for doing his will and grace and grace be with you and grace be with you A bad choir actually that's 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 pretty good so a couple of just quick announcements as as we go from me thank you for coming thank you for your questions thank you for engaging with mike so well um, and thank you all of you who are supporters of regent college and as you go out the door if you have enjoyed tonight's evening surely it's as as, as valuable to you as a movie ticket isn't it so if you're so inclined, you might put a donation into the donation box that allows us to keep things like our evening public lectures going and, of course, all of summer school. So there's, uh, there's that. And the other thing that's out there at the donation box is a little slip of paper which tells you, tells you about what we're doing on Saturday. Our own professor of Old Testament, Matt Lynch, is teaching on the world of Leviticus. And it is Saturday morning at 9.30 right here on the program that we call Bible Saturdays. So Matt will be here, and I think that will be really great, actually. So if you're interested, there it is. The recording from tonight's session will be available on our YouTube uh, channel, youtube.com stroke regent hyphen college until the end of August. And I invite you to spread that around and pass it along to people who weren't able to be with us uh, tonight. Uh, we only have a few copies of Mike's books. There are many, many books. We only have a few copies left. But if you meet us out there at the bookstore, he'll probably sign one if you wanted them. There's only a few, but um, Michael will be there if you uh, are so inclined. I just want to say thank you for joining us and look forward to seeing you again some evening this summer at Regent College. Good night and God bless.